Dune has much within its scope that is comparable with the heroic western tradition, and its use of mythology provides an excellent framework to understand the nature of its own unique hero. Having discussed the ideas, philosophies and concepts behind Herbert's own thoughts about the hero and the messianic impulses that overtake society, and Herbert's subtle subversion of these traditions in science fiction, it is best now to turn to the texts themselves. The best way to illustrate these ideas is via the action within the novels, the subtle way we as readers are led to take part in this messianic impulse in Dune, and our astonishment when this goes horribly wrong. The traits of the hero, indeed the archetypal tragic hero, are not just expressed through the character of Paul Atreides in Dune. Numerous characters in the novels, including Paul's father Leto, his son Leto II, Duncan Idaho, Liet Kynes, and Miles Tegg, all represent the concept of the dangerous hero, while the Baron Harkonnen, the Emperor Shaddam IV, and Fade Rautha represent typical inversions of the hero. They are unusual villains in that they often both understand the nature of the hero and how to subvert this role to their benefit. In addition, the messianic impulse of the masses is illustrated most effectively through the Fremen and their leaders, especially Stilgar. This is shown both in their attitudes and devotion to Paul and Liet Kynes, as well as through those that serve House Atreides with blind loyalty, such as Duncan Idaho, Gurney Halleck and Thufur Howitt. We must also not forget that we as readers of these novels are also complicit in our desire to see Paul succeed and become Emperor. Through the historical documents presented at the beginning of each chapter, the reader has knowledge of events beyond those of the characters in the novels, and is essentially a futuristic voyeur to the historical action of the narrative. In that sense our blindness to our hero's actions is overemphasised as we tend to ignore the warnings and conclusions presented in these documents. The reader cannot possibly see what is coming in Dune Messiah even though they are forewarned and given insight into events before they occur within the narrative. Hence the reader too is carried away in the messianic impulse that follows Paul Atreides. Leto Atreides and Vladimir Harkonnen The first primary example of a hero being disastrous for his people is Paul's father, Leto Atreides, the ruler of the planet Caladan. Leto is popular among the great houses of the Landsrad, and a distaff cousin to the Emperor Shaddam IV. Despite their family connection, Shaddam IV feels that Leto is a threat to his position and his throne partly because of his connection by blood, and hence possessing the ability to claim the throne. This is also partly because of Leto's popularity in the Landsrat, which makes up one third of the political tripod of power, the others being the guild and the imperial household of the emperor. Leto is not just popular within the political sphere of the Landsrat, but also with his own people on Caladan, and his own staff within House Atreides. His popularity is unusual in the manner of his rule, which is not absolute dictatorship akin to that of the Baron Harkonnen. Even upon meeting the Fremen, his reputation as to how he leads his people is known and established with them, when they say, it is said that the Duke Leto Atreides rules with the consent of the governed. The Duke's own loyal retainers have been gathered around him through either long traditional service to his family, such as his Mentat Master of Assassins, Thufur Howard, or through assistance to those who have a mutual hatred of the Harkonnen, as is the case with Duncan Idaho and Gurney Halleck. Their devotion to their duke is unwavering, and mirrors that of those he rules, which is unusual within the Feufreloik system. Both Gurney and Duncan represent people who have stepped outside of their place within such a feudal system as ultimately do the Fremen on Arrakis, who also end up blindly following Paul. Ultimately, loyalty to the Duke means that most of the members of his household, in a feudal sense, move to Arrakis and ultimately their doom, even with the knowledge that the planet is almost certainly presented as a lure into a fatal trap. The result is not only the death of Leto, 
but the near total destruction of House Atreides, its retainers, followers and citizens. Leto was a hero to his people, and a man who understands the necessity of gaining people's absolute loyalty. In one scene, Paul questions his father, wondering how the Emperor commands such fanatical loyalty and devotion from his elite shock troops, the Sardaukar. His father knows and understands how such loyalty can be cultivated. There are proven ways. Play on the certain knowledge of their superiority, the mystique of secret covenant, the esprit of shared suffering. It can be done. It has been done on many worlds, in many times. In understanding his enemies, Leto is not beyond their methods himself. It is his intent to walk into the trap set for him on Arrakis, because he feels he can exploit the Fremen there, who represent, as a people hardened by life on a very dangerous planet, a potential threat to the Sardaukar. Ultimately he is also aware that things can go badly wrong. On Arrakis, he receives new intelligence about how Paul is being revered by the Fremen in a religious light, both as the Mahdi and Lisan al Gib. Understanding if things do go badly, he recognises the power of religion and myth in the Fremen's attitude, and informs his son that if need be, he should exploit this if he is to survive. Power and fear, he said, the tools of statecraft. I must order a new emphasis on guerrilla training for you. That film clip there, they call you Mahdi, Lisan al Gib. As a last resort, you might capitalise on that. Lido's death in itself also leads to a development of mystique around his son and their family. The passages in the Dune novels which commence each chapter often represent some kind of future history, hagiography, biography, or religious commentary on the events of the novels from a future point of view. Leto's memory is enshrined throughout the novel and brings weight to his son's own myth. There is a legend that the instant Duke Leto Atreides died, a meteor streaked across the skies above his ancestral palace on Caladan. The Princess Irulan, Introduction to a Child's History of Muad'Dib. Leto is obviously presented as the archetypal father figure in Dune, but should also be viewed in terms of the hero as well, in this case the hero as a political leader. Although not conforming to any of Raglan's steps or Campbell's preconceptions of the typical monomyth hero, he is an ideal demonstration of what happens when people follow a leader blindly. He is a man both capable and aware of how to create a myth around his family and himself, and his people suffer an ultimately terrible catastrophe under his leadership. His mistake of leadership is amplified because he is an extraordinary man who takes extraordinary risks. Leto Atreides is named after Leto from Greek mythology, the daughter of the titans Phoebe and Coeus, who was through Zeus, the mother of the divine twins Artemis, Alia, and Apollo, Paul, and often associated with the moon. The inversion of gender here is also mirrored with other characters in Dune, and is suggestive of the inverting of the heroic themes as well as to emphasise the Janus aspect of the story. With Leto as the father of Artemis, a goddess of the wilderness, nature, fertility and childbirth, and Apollo, the god of music and prophecy, we see how Herbert is using his notions of universal mythology to create a sense of myth around Paul and Alia. As with the surname Atreides, the family of Agamemnon and Menelaus, the war leaders of the Trojan War, we are also being pointed towards a sense of great tragedy and disaster. In addition, the envy and jealousy of the Emperor Shaddam IV towards Leto, which ultimately sets the tragic fall of House Atreides in motion, is mirrored in the relationship of Hera and Leto in Greek mythology. The name of Atreides is also meant to suggest the longevity of the family in relation to both Earth's history and the Bene Gesserit Kwisatz Haderach breeding program. Aside from this, Leto also provides us with a standard to measure Paul's actions against, and represents to the reader a barometer through which we can regard his son's own actions 
and the changes he goes through. How do we approach the study of Moadib's father? A man of surpassing warmth and surprising coldness was the Duke Leto Atreides. Yet many facts open the way to this Duke. His abiding love for his Bene Gesserit lady, the dreams he held for his son, the devotion with which men served him. You see him there. A man snared by destiny, a lonely figure with his light dimmed behind the glory of his son. Still, one must ask, what is the son but an extension of the father? From Moadib, Family Commentaries by the Princess Irulan. The Baron Vladimir Harkonnen provides an interesting counterpoint to the actions of Duke Leto, and although both men are very different from each other, they are locked in a political feud that sees both go to comparable ends to achieve their similar goals of power, wealth, and the influence of their respective households and scions. Whereas Leto respects his family life and wishes the best for his son, he is grooming him for the role of running House Atreides. The Baron has similar ideas for his nephews, Fade Rautha and Raban. House Harkonnen in fact merely reflects a diabolical inversion of the attitudes and methods of House Atreides, in their power struggles. While Leto brings Paul up to understand concepts fundamental to how House Atreides operates, such as leadership, loyalty and justice, the Baron's upbringing of Fade and Raban is sophisticated in the sense that it presents an appearance to those that they rule over, which is far from the truth. An example of this is when the Baron has Fade fight duels in a gladiatorial arena, often against opponents who are drugged or already injured, presenting the view to their people that Fade is a mighty and athletic warrior. The Baron here understands the old Roman concept of bread and circuses, the purpose of which, even under House Harkonnen's sadistic rule, is to create a hero out of Fade. As the crowd of the arena swarm around the victorious Fade after dispatching another victim, there is none of the real concern that normally surrounds noble-born members of a household in the feudal world of the Empire. Fade's opponent is one of Leto's captured soldiers who in seeking revenge has a very strong desire to kill the Harkonnen and in another Machiavellian plot, his opponent is not drugged and very dangerous indeed. Fade is victorious however, and has a certain uncharacteristic respect for the dead man who fights with an almost superhuman ability, knowing he is doomed. What makes a man fight in such a manner concerns Fade, but is still able to bolster himself in order to pander to the crowd's sympathies. At this point the Baron lowers the shields around the arena, allowing the crowd to surround Fade. It is in fact the Emperor's agent and assassin, Count Fenring, who shows concern at this unusual breach in security. No one will harm the lad, the Baron said. He's a hero. The first of the charging mass reached Fade Rautha, lifted him on their shoulders, began parading around the arena. He could walk unarmed and unshielded through the poorest quarters of Harko tonight, the Baron said. They'd give him the last of their food and drink, just for his company. In attempting to control the spice production on Arrakis, and especially the unruly Fremen, the Baron, just like Leto, also has plans to manipulate the situation to gain the people's support for Fade, whom he intends to govern the world. The Baron's methods do however vary quite drastically from those of the Atreides, and shows his lack of understanding of the ferocity with which the Fremen both guard their world and are prepared to live and die for their messiah. His strategy is to send in his other nephew, the beast Raban, the Fool, to sadistically crush the population, eventually allowing Fade to come and kill his brother and in doing so become a hero to the Fremen. Although this fails drastically, again we see here an attempt to control a people through the concept of a hero, which hopefully will garner devotion and blind obedience. The Baron is an archetypal villain, intelligent and Machiavellian, yet at the same time a gross and obscene character, whose dark nature is expressed in Dune through his physical stature and both homosexual and paedophilic sexual appetites. His name is suggestive of his villainy, 
and leads us to examine common mythic traits. The name Vladimir is immediately suggestive of Vlad the Impaler, while Harkonnen denotes an ancient heritage that has genetic lines tracing far away into the dawn times of Greek and Pathan and Mameluk, shadows of ancient history that few outside of professional historians or those trained by the Bene Gesserit could even name. It is also worth pointing out that during this time of Cold War anxiety, the name Baron Harkonnen could also be invoking the fears represented by communism and the USSR. Liet Kynes is also a hero and messianic figure of sorts to the Fremen of Arrakis, and in a sense represents a secondary father figure to Paul, who loves his daughter, Chani. Kynes is the imperial ecologist, though he himself prefers the term planetologist and the emperor's judge of the change, a position the purpose of which is to ensure and report on the transition of power on Arrakis from House Harkonnen to House Atreides. In the first appendix of Dune, entitled The Ecology of Dune, we learn how Liet took over from his father Pardo Kynes, the first planetologist of Arrakis. Liet's mother is a Fremen, and he is raised in this manner. He is also raised with an education in ecology, which his father provides him with. He is able to inherit his father's position as imperial ecologist due to the feudal Faufreloix class structure, and remains a rare good example of this within the novel. His father was an ecologist and so he too is expected to become one. As such, it is principally down to the Kynes family that the Fremen have begun their long term plans to transform the ecology of Arrakis from a desert world to an Eden like paradise. The course had been set by this time. The ecological Fremen were aimed along their way. Liet Kynes had only to watch and nudge and spy upon the Harkonnens until the day his planet was afflicted by a hero. After Kynes has been left for dead in the desert by the Harkonnen, with his still suit torn, he wanders thinking over the discussions and lessons his father taught him and the path that he has set the Fremen on. Both Liet and Pardot Kynes are aware of the necessities required around a long term ecological project. In understanding the requirements of the planet, and the need to use the Fremen as tools of geomorphic change, they also recognise the different ways that ecology can be managed through the Fremen. Their lifestyle can be used to promote and ensure these changes continue through politics, culture, religion and economy. Pardo Kynes only sees one thing as being problematic for his cause, which is that of changing the face of Arrakis. No more terrible disaster could befall your people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero, his father said. Liet, however, in his dying moments finally understands that which his father did not, namely that the superstitions of the Fremen relating to the Lisan al Gaib and Mahdi can be used to assist this process of change. Kind's final revelation in the chapter which features most heavily ecology as its theme is the realisation that his father and other ecologists have in fact been incorrect the entire time, and that more often than not, accident and error govern how events and plans really turn out. Liet, like the other father figure and hero archetype Leto I, brings disaster to his people the Fremen, who superstitiously and blindly follow his ecological goals. Kynes also represents the bringing of western ideas of the environment and ecology to a people who are used to living symbiotically within their ecosystem. The ecological changes he sets in motion will ultimately bring destruction to the Fremen as their planet transforms from a harsh desert to a garden world. In Leto we are presented with a charismatic and heroic father figure ultimately destroyed by the machinations of treachery and political intrigue. With Paul Atreides we find a more conventional hero, at least when we first meet him. Paul's birth itself is a result of the devotion of his mother Jessica to Duke Leto. Leto's desire is to have a son in order to continue on as leader of House Atreides. However, Jessica, as a Bene Gesserit, has been ordered only to produce daughters to House Atreides as part of their breeding program. The Emperor himself 
who also has a desire for a son, has also only produced daughters as a result of this program. The Bene Gesserit's intent is to breed an Atreides female to a Harkonnen male, in order to create the Kwisatz Haderach, a male superbeing with the powers of the female Bene Gesserit. Because of her love for Leto, Jessica disobeys her orders and produces Paul, who goes on to become a Kwisatz Haderach, albeit one generation earlier than the Bene Gesserit had intended. We first meet Paul at the beginning of the novel, when he is observed by the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam. Aware of being observed as he sleeps, Paul dreams of Arrakis before awakening and practicing mind-body awareness exercises prior to being tested by the Reverend Mother. The test that she puts him under is the Gom Jabbar. Reverend Mother Mohiam holds a Gom Jabbar at his neck, essentially a poison needle which kills only animals, while forcing him to put his hand inside a black box. If Paul takes his hand out of the box, he dies. If he does not, he survives. The box induces pain to an extreme degree, and Paul is able to overcome this by his training and his mental awareness. The old woman said, You've heard of animals chewing off a leg to escape a trap? There's an animal kind of trick. A human would remain in the trap endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. The itch became the faintest burning. Why are you doing this? he demanded. To determine if you are human, be silent. Paul passes the test and lives to see that no real harm has been done at all. The test as we go on to discover has to do with the Great Convention. The Reverend Mother explains that the test is to set him free, and quotes the Orange Catholic Bible to him in relation to not making a machine akin to a human mind. This opening section of the novel not only serves to introduce us to Paul, but also to immediately immerse us subtly in the political and religious spheres of the Dune universe. While being taught this lesson, Paul not only demonstrates his unusual talents, but also his higher cognitive abilities, as is illustrated when he is able to determine the true function of the Bene Gesserit schools, which happens to be political rather than the religious aspect they like to promote. In addition, we understand that Paul is able to detect the truth, and the Reverend Mother adds to our sense of mystique about Paul when we learn that he may be the Kwisatz Haderach, the one who can be many places at once. In setting out to question and explore these periodic messianic convulsions and our role in them, Herbert at the beginning of Dune immediately starts to impact upon our sense of wonder about Paul Atreides, and makes us question how special a character he really is. In exploring the role of people in these periodic messianic compulsions, Herbert subtly makes the reader themselves experience this directly throughout the novel. Frank Herbert makes sure our sympathy is continually directed towards Paul and House Atreides by our own false sense of prescience throughout the Dune novels. This is created by the various future histories, commentaries and hagiographies that precede each chapter throughout all the Dune novels. In a sense, we share the malaise of Paul's prescience, in that we are both able to determine a little of what lies ahead, and are simultaneously powerless to alter the future of the events in the story, forewarned as we are with these fragments gleaned from the rich literary tapestry that Herbert weaves. Hence we know for example from the works called The Dictionary of Moadib and Moadib Family Commentaries by the Princess Irulan, that the Sukh Dr. Yui will eventually betray the Atreides to the Harkonnens before the event occurs in the narrative. Paul, as we discover early on, is also a mentat, possessing yet another talent that makes us sense the superhuman qualities in this youth and the potential he has as a leader. As his father puts it, a mentat duke would be formidable indeed. The mentat is essentially a person trained as a human computer, able to process vast amounts of data, and are prized by the great houses, 
as thinking computers and machines are strictly forbidden by the Great Convention. As Paul moves with his family to Arrakis, our sense of foreboding regarding the Atreides increases, and along with this, Paul's prescient dreams start to take on a greater intensity as he is now surrounded by the drug melange that exists in the food, water, and even the air he breathes on the desert planet. The sense that Paul might be the one the Fremen call the Mahdi, the Lisan al Gaib, continues through the rumours and whisperings of the people of Arakin and the Duke's new staff in the palace. As our foreboding increases, our sense of mystique and the superhuman about Paul and his mother Jessica continues to grow. Paul and Jessica have unusual encounters with the Duke's new housekeeper, the Shadowed Mapes. The Shadowed Mapes tests Jessica according to the Fremen's legends about the Lisan al Gaib, who will be brought to Arrakis by his mother, a reverend mother of the Bene Gesserit. The sense of prophecy being fulfilled is obvious to Mapes when she presents the gift of a Chris knife, a blade made from a tooth of the worms of Arrakis. Jessica is able to answer her probing questions and increase the sense of mystery around both her and her son. It is through the Missionaria Protectiva that Jessica is able to do this, understanding the religious, cultural and linguistic concepts that are shored up in the meaning of the knife's purpose. She immediately realises that the order she belongs to, the Bene Gesserit, has planted these myths in the distant past as part of a long term survival strategy. The Missionaria Protectiva is essentially a propaganda tool that allows any stranded member of the Sisterhood to manipulate a local population based on their religion, myths and legends. The seeds of these religious concepts are sown long in the past of these cultures, and when a Bene Gesserit is in need, she may use these myths and appear as if fulfilling prophecy, often guaranteeing them a position of safety, reverence and power. Numerous myths and religious tropes are planted on different worlds, depending on the circumstances there. On realising that this particular myth has been planted on Arrakis, it is enough to tell Jessica a little about this world. Jessica hesitated. The thing must take its course. That was a specific catchphrase from the Missionaria Protectiva's stock of incantations, the coming of the Reverend Mother to free you. But I'm not a Reverend Mother, Jessica thought, and then, Great Mother, they planted that one here. This must be a hideous place. The Missionaria Protectiva is Herbert's own way of presenting a monomythic structure to the Dune universe, and illustrates the ability of the Bene Gesserit to easily manipulate entire populations and their leaders. To a certain degree, the Missionaria Protectiva requires a messianic character to be able to carry forth the concept of subverting religious beliefs for one's own survival or political necessity. The Fremen have easily been captivated by Liet Kynes' idea of changing their planet's ecology, and it takes very little for them to see in Paul and Jessica their messiah and his holy mother. The tension in the narrative increases as we approach the inevitable fall of House Atreides, and Paul is tested yet again, this time by an assassination attempt. His heroic accoutrements are added to again in the eyes of the reader, as he saves the life of Mapes, unnecessarily putting his own at risk at the same time. His reward is to become armed with the same knowledge we, as readers, already possess that there is a traitor among his father's household. Paul's continual testing and trials represent not only a journey towards manhood, but also part of his journey towards apotheosis. The Gom Jabbar at the beginning of Dune tests his perception and observation, as well as his ability to deal with crisis. In addition, the teachers his father has provided for him test his combat abilities, though in more an academic fashion. The assassination attempt on Paul represents his first transition to manhood through an ordeal of violence, and at the same time, one of the trials an archetypal hero must face. The Fremen's attitude to Paul is further revealed to us in this chapter, which illustrates greatly the various systems on Arrakis 
which I will discuss at greater length later. But it is his introduction to one such system, that of the Stilsuit, that again helps enforce our, and the Fremen's, sense of mysticism about this young man. The Stilsuit is a filter and heat exchange system which allows its wearer to preserve almost all of the body's moisture in the desert, a tool essential for survival on Arrakis. When meeting Liat Kynes for the first time, the planetary ecologist advises the Duke and his party on how to wear and breathe in such a suit for maximum efficiency. Paul, however, has already worked out how to do this, and has donned his still suit desert fashion. This prompts Kynes to speculate on whether Paul is indeed the messiah spoken of in Fremen legends. And Kynes rubbed his cheek, thinking of the legend, he shall know your ways as though born to them. Paul's talents of observation and truth sense also impress Kynes when he is able to identify correctly two Fremen fleeing from a spice harvester. Again Kynes applies what he sees to the prophecies of the Lisan al Gaib, remembering that he shall see through all subterfuge. Kynes reserves judgment on the Atreides, initially indicating a point of view that they are no better than the Harkonnen. His attitudes to the Duke and his family do change by the actions of the Atreides, and the potential manifestation of the fulfilment of prophecy by Paul. It is a relationship that helps ultimately to save the lives of Paul and his mother. After the inevitable fall of House Atreides, Paul and his mother are able to escape into the desert, though the attrition to House Atreides is enormous, with the Duke, Yui, and Duncan Idaho all killed during or after the Harkonnen attack. It is while spending their first night in the desert that Paul's transformation finally begins, as he and his mother hide in a still tent. It is at this point that Paul experiences a rebirth into a new consciousness. When he emerges from the tent, we realise he is a Kwisatz Sadarak, a male Bene Gesserit with superhuman abilities. He is more than just a Mentat Duke, and something else altogether. He is able to determine that his mother is pregnant with his sister, and another revelation becomes apparent to his sight. His mother is the daughter of the Baron Harkonnen. The dreams that Paul had experienced have now become a fully developed prescient ability, and we start to realise, as Paul does, that he has some terrible purpose. Upon discovering that the spice is in everything on Arrakis, even in the air, his awareness increases to the point where he is able to see the various paths laid out ahead of him, the possible futures, and his role in them. These possible futures finally reveal to Paul the intent of the Bene Gesserit's breeding program, to renew the human race by war, a long term approach to evolution by social Darwinism and artificial selection to help create new and stronger genetic bloodlines in the human race. He had seen a warrior religion there, a fire spreading across the universe with the Atreides green and black banner waving at the head of fanatic legions drunk on spice liquor. Gurney Halleck and a few others of his father's men, a pitiful few, were among them, all marked by the hawk symbol from the shrine of his father's skull. I can't go that way, he muttered. That's what the old witches of your schools really want. I don't understand you, Paul, his mother said. He remained silent, thinking like the seed he was, thinking with the race consciousness he had first experienced as terrible purpose, he found that he no longer could hate the Bene Gesserit or the Emperor or even the Harkonnens. They were all caught up in the need of their race to renew its scattered inheritance, to cross and mingle and infuse their bloodlines in a great new pulling of genes. And the race knew only one sure way for this, the ancient way the tried and certain way that ruled over everything in its path. Jihad. It is upon his emergence from the tent that Paul is really Moadib, his prescience knowing that this is what the Fremen will call him. At this point in June, we begin the second part of the novel, and we witness both Paul and his mother's transformation into Fremen.
and the rise of Paul in their ranks, not just as a leader, but as a prophet and messiah. Simultaneously, as Paul's psychological transformation begins to move towards his role as messiah and hero, he also suffers what is essentially a minor death to his personality, losing some of his humanity. This is in part due to the increased heightening of both his mentat powers and his awareness, looking at events from a cold dispassionate point of view, even to the point where he is initially unable to mourn for his dead father. As Paul and his mother join the ranks of the Fremen, he is once again forced to go through a series of life-threatening tests. This is part of the road of trials in Campbell's second stage of the heroic journey in the monomyth, namely the initiation. Almost immediately, Paul is forced into a Tahadi challenge, essentially single combat to the death with a young Fremen called Jamis. Paul is victorious although Jamis is the first person he has ever killed, and he begins to be immersed in Fremen culture and tradition from this point. Victory means he claims Jamis's water, as well as the responsibility for his wife Hara and her children. It is in the ceremony for the recently deceased Jamis that Paul again impacts his mystique upon the Fremen by shedding tears for the dead man, on a world where every single drop of water is preserved by necessity. These tears are seen as a great honour by the Fremen and a gift from him to the shadow world. This also reinforces Miller's idea of the hero as an intermediary, and the sense that this should be something to fear. The first time Paul is viewed in this way, it is immediately after his first killing of a man, one of the Fremen's own tribe members. As Paul is accepted by the Fremen with a sense of awe, his mother Jessica, who has already been accepted as a Syadina or Holy Acolyte, must also pass a deadly test in order to become the tribe's new reverend mother. The test involves taking the bile from a drowned maker, the larval stage of the sandworms of Arrakis, and transforming the poisonous bile into a safe drug that is to be used in an orgiastic ritual by the tribe. Jessica is forced to focus on a psychokinesthetic extension of herself and look within her body to alter the chemical structure of the bile until it is safe. As the poisonous bile is transformed by Jessica, she changes into a Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother. Once this has occurred, the old Reverend Mother Ramalo passes on her memories to Jessica, only to realise with horror that Jessica is pregnant with Paul's sister, Alia. Alia will be born with all the knowledge of a fully grown Reverend Mother, and in many ways will be as unusual and powerful as her brother. The Fremen consume the transformed drug and use it in an orgiastic ritual, in many ways similar to the use of psychotropic drugs in early religions and mysteries. Paul is able to sense that the drug is in some way a poison, and only consumes it once his mother informs him that it is safe. The drug opens his awareness and inflates again his prescient ability. From this time on Paul's focus on the future and the possibilities open to him are fully realised, though the probabilities contained therein occasionally hide some things from him. At this stage therefore, Paul is still able to be surprised by what occurs in the world, not being fully prescient. His focus however is increasingly orientated towards death, whether it be the death of the billions who will die in the jihad to come, carried out in his name, or the myriad of possible deaths he is able to see for himself, if he does not divert from his path. His development into a hero is key at this point, as his realisation that even association of his death will leave a great impact upon the universe. Paul has already realised that his mother through his unborn sister would create another religious figure in the Bene Gesserit mould for the Fremen to focus their energies upon. In doing this, through his prescience, Paul sees that she has ensured that even if he does die, the Jihad will go on, only with Alia at its centre. 
As Paul continues to grow and develop into a guerrilla leader and a religious icon to the Fremen, the tests he undergoes become more and more hazardous. As we follow him on his journey, our sense of the narrative in Dune becomes increasingly focused towards its epic nature, with Paul as our epic hero. It will only be later with both Dune Messiah and Children of Dune that this focus will shift. With Herbert's deliberate intention of undermining the hero that we follow throughout the narrative, who we are increasingly in awe of, just as the Fremen are, it will only be as we progress through the first Dune trilogy that we will realise that Paul's status as hero will shift fundamentally away from the traditional epic hero towards the tragic hero. Paul's status as a religious icon, prophet, and messiah becomes increasingly cemented in Fremen culture as we move through Book 3 of Dune. It becomes increasingly difficult to tell past from present and present from future. In the two years that have passed from the events in Book 2, the third part of Dune, named The Prophet, shows us the different ways that Paul and Alia are accepted by the Fremen. Whereas Paul faces a number of challenges in single combat, many of which are handled by his lover Chani, Alia's unusual abilities made manifest in the female other memory of the Bene Gesserit begin to greatly disturb the Fremen. Paul has two final heroic tests before him, prior to his attainment of apotheosis. The first of these is to ride one of the great worms of the desert, revered by the Fremen as both Shai Halud and Shaitan. Again, this test viewed through Paul's prescience focuses on death. If he succeeds, events will progress and he feels he may still be able to stop the jihad that has to come. If he dies, he is able to see that the jihad will continue regardless. The only thing that is certain is that either way, the Fremen will view what happens as a legend whether he succeeds or fails. At the same time, many of the younger Fremen feel that if Paul succeeds in riding the worm, then he must challenge Stilgar in a traditional duel to the death over the Fremen's leadership, something Paul does not wish to do and avoid if possible. Paul succeeds in riding the worm, which again represents another process of rebirth for the hero, though this time it is more of a cultural rebirth as well as an affirmation of his manhood. It is only through the act of riding a worm that a Fremen truly enters manhood, and is another one of their rituals tied to their ecologically focused religion. Paul understands the necessity for this, and after his success says, And I am a Fremen born this day, here in the Habena Urg. I have had no life before this day. I was a child until this day. Paul's solution to his leadership crisis is finally to accept the full mantle of religious leader of the Fremen as well as reinstating his ducal right to rule Arrakis, leaving Stilgar in his secular role as leader of Siege Tabar. In keeping Stilgar alive, Paul makes a change to Fremen custom, bringing back elements of the rule of the Empire. In a sense we can also view this as a beginning of the death of the Fremen way of life on Arrakis, something that continues to degenerate throughout the course of the novels. Hence Paul's leadership will now start to change the Fremen, ultimately for the worse, when they will become museum Fremen, sad remnants of their former selves. The culmination of Paul's abilities comes with one final task before he confronts his enemies, the Harkonnen and the Emperor. He must consume the water of life and safely transmute the poisonous bile of the Sandtroud in order to fully recognise his potential as a Kwisatz Haderach. This is the last process of death and renewal, a descent into the underworld that is very nearly fatal. This descent is another common mytheme in the heroic tradition and is again symbolic of the death and rebirth of the hero. A hero must descend into the underworld, or hell, before emerging reborn to vanquish his enemies. This descent is mirrored in the litany against fear, as a little death that allows the hero to accomplish their task free of the fear of death and failure. 
The hero is only single-minded of purpose from this point on, and to a certain degree has shed not just their fear, but to a certain extent some of their humanity as well. Paul ends up in a near-death state for three weeks, looking within at the place where only the Kwisatz Haderach can go, and where the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mothers cannot. The realisation that Paul is the culmination of the Bene Gesserit breeding program is not lost upon Jessica, and it gives her very little comfort. Paul explains his role as the Kwisatz Sadrach as follows. Paul said, There is in each of us an ancient force that takes and an ancient force that gives. A man finds little difficulty facing that place within himself where the taking force dwells, but it's almost impossible for him to see into the giving force without changing into something other than man. For a woman, the situation is reversed. Jessica looked up, found Chani was staring at her while listening to Paul. Do you understand me, mother? Paul asked. She could only nod. These things are so ancient within us, Paul said, that they're ground into each separate cell of our bodies, we're shaped by such forces. You can say to yourself, yes, I see how such a thing may be. But when you look inward and confront the raw force of your own life unshielded, you see your peril. You see that this could overwhelm you. The greatest peril to the giver is the force that takes. The greatest peril to the taker is the force that gives. It's as easy to be overwhelmed by giving as by taking. And you, my son, Jessica asked, are you one who gives or one who takes? I'm at the fulcrum, he said. I cannot give without taking, and I cannot take without... Paul is now fully transformed, at once a hero, prophet, messiah, and duke to the Fremen. He is finally ready to lead them against their oppressors and help bring about the realisation of their religious and ecological ambitions. With becoming the Kwisatz Haderach, a little more of his humanity is drained away, even to the extent of failing to prevent the death of his son Leto. His prescience is not perfect however, and the sacrifices that Paul accepts are as far as he perceives his actions to be necessary for the greater good to prevent the jihad he sees coming. As he approaches the very anticlimactic conclusion to the action in June, Paul's prescience becomes more and more muddled. He is unable to foresee his son's death, or for that matter, to prevent it. His association with the heroic tradition, in that he is fundamentally related to death and destruction, becomes apparent to him. Everything he touches seems to now only bring death and grief. The narrative concludes with both Paul and Alia settling old scores and creating new alliances. Alia kills her grandfather, the Baron Harkonnen, whilst Paul slays Fade Rautha in one last final test before usurping Shaddam IV and placing himself on the throne. He has led the Fremen to freedom, defeated his adversaries, and become the most powerful man in the universe. In terms of a heroic narrative, he has been presented by Herbert as a successful hero, albeit flawed to a certain but apparently minor degree. He has fulfilled the first thirteen of Lord Raglan's ritual steps that the hero must follow. Herbert began writing a sequel to Dune in 1968, originally intending to call the novel Full Saint, and then The Messiah. He eventually settled on the name Dune Messiah. Initially, because of the path followed and the nature of his hero, John W. Campbell, editor of the magazine Analog, which first published Dune in its serialised form, was far from happy with Herbert's treatment of the sequel. In The Road to Dune, some of the Frank Herbert John W. Campbell correspondence has been preserved. Campbell's initial response to Frank Herbert's first treatment of Dune Messiah is as follows. Paul commits acts of absolute folly, which you seek to explain on the basis of his vision requires it. Paul winds up as a god that failed. He winds up, in Fremen terms, which he accepts as useless to the tribe cripple abandoned in the desert. In outline, it sounds like an epic tragedy, but when you start looking back on it, it works out to 
Paul was a damn fool and surely no demigod. He loused up himself, his loved ones and the whole galaxy. Herbert immediately began work on a new treatment of Dune Messiah which was forwarded to his agent who received it with a positive outlook. The new treatment was sent to John W. Campbell who again reacted to the new text unfavourably. Herbert's vision of the Messiah still didn't satisfy me. In this one, it's Paul, our central character, who is a helpless pawn manipulated against his will by a cruel destructive fate. The reactions of science fictioneers, however, over the last few decades have persistently and quite explicitly been that they want heroes, not anti-heroes. They want stories of strong men who exert themselves, inspire others, and make a monkey's uncle out of malign fates. Campbell's response is highly indicative of the stagnation that riddled the American pulp science fiction publishers at the time. It showed little insight into Herbert's intent to present a hero whose abilities were fundamentally though not intentionally destructive to society and whose mystique led to utter obedience and infatuation amongst his people. In fact, anti-heroes were becoming popular from this time on, and Campbell who saw himself as a father to several supermen was oblivious to this. The comments he presented in the above correspondence show his interest in the Ubermensch type hero that had indeed been popular for some time, especially in the works of authors such as A. E. Van Vogt. But that trend had begun in the late 30s and early 40s, and science fiction had almost passed through the 60s and into the 70s, a time of great change within the genre. Dune had been hailed as a great success, it had developed a reputation as a famous underground novel, its sales were increasing steadily day by day and had acquired several accolades, including the Hugo and Nebula Awards. In spite of this, John W. Campbell ultimately refused to publish Dune Messiah, being unable to consolidate himself with what was inherently a hero in direct opposition to the stagnating supermen of the golden age of science fiction that he was churning out. In Dune Messiah, Herbert created a classic inversion of themes that demonstrated his success at attacking the science fiction hero. So much so, that Dune Messiah was not published until eventually Galaxy Magazine accepted the story and ran it in a total of five instalments between July and November in 1969. It was simply not what John W. Campbell wanted, but it was what science fiction readers liked. While in Dune we are subtly misled into following the hero Paul, in Dune Messiah we are shocked from the very beginning to discover the wholesale death and destruction that his theocratic imperialism has brought to the universe in only 12 years. Paul is still very much the protagonist of the story, but as a hero the consequences of his actions are uncomfortable at the very least to the reader. As the Emperor Muad'Dib, Paul dominates the universe by his control of the oracular geriatric spice Melange. All of the major political players rely on Melange, the guild navigators rely on it for space travel, the Bene Gesserit's Reverend Mothers use it to see within themselves and use the other memory of the female genetic line, and Melange's properties as a geriatric drug mean that many who have depended upon it to extend their natural lifespan die from withdrawal of the drug. Dune Messiah moves away from the heroic adventure of Dune and is a much more politically charged novel. Although there are still elements of action and adventure, a great deal of what occurs within the novel focuses on a Machiavellian conspiracy to wrest power away from Paul. In moving away from the form of the epic heroic adventure, Dune Messiah as a much smaller work than Dune focuses much more directly on the tragic elements of its epic hero. It is also very much a bridging novel between Dune and Children of Dune, Herbert having always conceived the work as being in three key parts. Dune Messiah begins with a recap prologue, followed by a first chapter that presents a historical analysis of Bronzo of Ix, which in similarity to Dune, lets the reader into some of what lies ahead. Paul rules the universe as emperor, 
while having placed his sister Alia on a religious throne, leading the faith of the Quisarati, who worship Moadib. Paul and his family are plotted against by a group of conspirators made up of the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen of Mohim, a Benny Tylax by the name of Skytail, a guild steersman called Edric, and Paul's wife, Irulan. The aim of their plot is complex. First, they attempt to muddy Paul's oracular vision to hide their intentions. They do this with the help of Edric, whose abilities as a guild steersman offer him a degree of the same prescient power that Paul possesses. To a certain extent, this is also done by the introduction of the Dune Taro, which from the Bene Gesserit point of view also helps muddy Paul's prescience. They also intend to prevent Paul's concubine Chani from conceiving a child by administrating a contraceptive poison in her food and drink. This is because ultimately Irulan wants to father a child by Paul and have her own heir to his empire ruled formerly by her father. The guild and the Bene Gesserit have the need to regain a certain control over the spice melange, upon which both of whom heavily rely. The other part of their plan is therefore to attempt to capture a worm of Arrakis and take it off world, in the hope of breaking the spice monopoly. As for Skytail, who is a face dancer, able to assume the shape and personality of any given individual, his intent is to present Paul with a very unusual gift, namely a gola of his deceased mentor Duncan Idaho, that goes by the name of Hate. Ultimately the Bene Chlilax hope to control Paul by having his wife killed, and understanding that once dead she can be cloned and have her personality restored as a gola, he will succumb to his grief and ask for this unthinkable boon. Where Jun Messiah differs significantly from its handling of its heroic and messianic themes is in the systems of power that develop around Paul and those individuals who control them. The conspiracy against Paul is one such group, while the religious Quisarate who follow the religion of Moadib is another. The Fremen, and in particular the Naibs and Jihadists, are another group struggling to come to terms with their place in a very different universe from the one they knew some twelve years before. Finally, the barometer for these changes is surely Paul's friend, former leader, teacher and companion, the Fremen Stilgar, who has become the Minister of State. Stilgar is at once part of the administration of Paul's government, but at the same time deeply resentful of the hateful pomp which surrounds Moadib's throne. Reiterating Herbert's concept that even with a fantastically powerful and charismatic figurehead, eventually fallible mortals take over the power structure that always comes into being around such a leader, we find the true theme in Dune Messiah. The power structures that are attempting to develop around Paul Atreides are desired by those slavish people who have given all their critical faculties over to their living God. The followers that develop the corresponding systems of power and control around their heroes, ultimately destroying them, make up the second part of Herbert's concept of the messianic impulse and why heroes are so dangerous to society. Paul's only real desire is to renounce the religion that has developed around him, and to live a happy peaceful life with his beloved Chani, but the future haunts him, knowing that people will use his name, or his sisters, to carry on the religion. Ultimately he does not give in to his desires, as he knows that if he does not attempt to follow the golden path, humanity's extinction lies at the end of it. As Farrakh, just before he is murdered by Skytail, notes, the apparatus of government accompanies him everywhere, clerks and attendants and attendants for the attendants. Paul's religion itself has grown into, as Skytail observes, myth all tangled up with facts, as well as a lumbering bureaucracy. The most obvious example of this slavish obedience combined with a desire to take over the religious bureaucracy in Jim Messiah is Korba the Quizara, the former Feda king who has now become a priest. Both Paul and Alia are fully disapproving of Korba and the activities of his Quizarati, who are viewed as spies by the people. Korba is a fanatic 
who greatly enjoys the religious power that he possesses as part of Paul's administration, but Paul himself views the former death commando with amusement, asking himself, what is more ridiculous than a death commando transformed into a priest? As various groups bolster their influence to attempt to limit Paul's imperial government, it is Corba who suggests that a religious constitution be created. It is the religious mystique that surrounds the Atreides family that is in part a tool of their statecraft, albeit an essentially deceitful one. This mystique in turn creates most of the slavish obedience that the majority of Paul's citizens, especially the Fremen, hold for them. Stilgar alone is able to grasp to a certain extent that his friends Paul and Alia are not gods, though the sense of mystique is still great within him. In that light, both Paul and Alia try to a certain extent to educate Stilgar about their unusual abilities, though not always with success. Stilgar is nonetheless insightful and intelligent, understanding that his queen witch and sorcerer friend betrayed dangerous weaknesses. After a visit from the guild steersmen Edric and Skytail, Paul continues to attempt to educate Stilgar in the long term effects of his rule. He does this by presenting some fragments of history from before the Butlerian Jihad, what are essentially to Stilgar, myths of Old Earth. Paul presents in particular two examples of Old Earth emperors, namely Genghis Khan and Adolf Hitler. The atrocities of Genghis Khan and Hitler are presented to Stilgar merely as statistics relating to the number of people they killed. Stilgar is at first impressed, thinking that these individuals killed their victims personally, but Paul's lesson to Stilgar is that both individuals killed the same way he does, through their legions. Four million killed by Genghis Khan and six million by Hitler leave Stilgar ultimately unimpressed compared to the destructive power of Muad'Dib. Not very impressive statistics my lord. Very good still. Paul glanced at the reels in Corba's hands. Corba stood with them as though he wished he could drop them and flee. Statistics. At a conservative estimate, I've killed 61 billion, sterilised 90 planets, completely demoralised 500 other, I've wiped out the followers of 40 religions which had existed since. Unbelievers, Corba protested. Unbelievers all! No, Paul said. Believers. Corba firmly believes that Muad'Dib's religion has brought the people of a thousand worlds into the light and glory of the Emperor. But Paul understands the opposite. He has brought death and destruction to a vast number of people and worlds and firmly believes that mankind will be a long time recovering from the effects of his rule. Still he does this out of the necessity of the golden path, only through which can humanity survive. Corba's comments illustrate to both the reader and to Paul exactly who does control the universe and his power base. The exchange in this chapter highlights that Stilgar has yet to fall into slavish obedience to Paul while at the same time showing how slavish and unthinking Corba has become. Paul's intent in providing these educational moments to Stilgar is to ensure he has a friend who still remains loyal to him and his family, yet at the same time has retained his own faculties and judgement. The legions control, Paul said. I wonder if they know this. You control your legions, sire, Stilgar interrupted and it was obvious from the tone of his voice that he suddenly felt his own position in that chain of command, his own hand guiding all that power. Corba, however, is beyond redemption. His thinking has been given over completely to the religion of Moadib, and he relishes his power in the Quisarate. Most importantly, he has forgotten he is a Fremen. The problem for Paul and his sister lies in the nature of their rule, and how their power base is focused on not just Paul's oracular vision, but also the religious mystique and fervour that have grown around them. The mystique has become a necessity of their rule, and to a large degree they must pander to it in order to rule. 
this facet of their rule is nonetheless a product of the Bene Gesserit's Missionaria Protectiva, manipulated by them and their mother over the years to enable them to survive and be accepted by the Fremen. Paul's visions, boosted by his use of the oracular spice melange and draped in Zen Sunni mystery, continue to trouble him. He is plagued by images of a missing moon, symbolic of the destruction his government and religion have brought to the Fremen's way of life. But the moon is also symbolic of his love for Chani, his concubine, and the missing moon also represents the death of Chani, as those who seek to control some part of his rule target her. The Gola hate, trained in both Zen Sunni philosophy and as a mentat, attempts to interpret Paul's vision, telling him he is drunk on too much time. The mystery of Paul's visions, as he explains it using mentat logic, is that Paul runs from death and the fear of the power his vision grants. But the Gola realises that Paul's empire must live its time and die, like all others throughout history. Ever increasing to Paul at this point is his terrible purpose, and the desire to evade it and spend a simple life with Chani. Paul therefore attempts to bargain with the Bene Gesserit for the life of Chani, offering his seed and the artificial insemination of Irula. This will allow the Bene Gesserit to continue their breeding program, but at the same time preventing any child of Irula becoming his heir. Despite being poisoned with a contraceptive, Chani has managed to conceive a child of Paul's and is now pregnant with, unknown to Paul, the twins Leto and Ganima. The conspiracy against Paul feels the need to move against him quicker now, as Paul's oracular vision has revealed they intend to strike at him through Chani. They are aware that Paul's government is most unusual and has left its mark across the whole universe. To topple it will have dire, far-flung and unforeseen consequences. Skytail, the main threat to Paul from the conspiracy, is as ever shrewd when he describes the characteristics of Paul's government, once again highlighting Herbert's idea of the nature of power and the satellites that develop around it. It is not just a religion, Skytail said, wondering what the Reverend Mother would say to this harsh education of their fellow conspirator. Religious government is something else. Moadib has crowded his quizarate in everywhere, displaced the old functions of government. But he has bishoprics, islands of authority. At the centre of each island is a man. Men learn how to gain and hold personal power. Men are jealous. The conspiracy decides to move against Paul with the hate Gola, whom they believe is still under their control. However, the hate Gola is regaining more and more of his memories every day, becoming more and more Duncan Idaho. Paul also now knows that Chani will die in childbirth, and that to a certain extent, the poisonous contraceptive that Irlan has been feeding her has extended her life. But now that she is pregnant, and forced to go on a Fremen diet, eating and drinking the spice, her pregnancy is being accelerated and her metabolism along with it. The trap for Paul is sprung, and he is enticed to honour a water debt to an old Fremen and former Feda king, Othim. The trap is set by the face dancer Skytail, in the disguise of Othim's daughter, who informs him that there is a plot against him amongst the Fremen. Paul is aware of the trap but goes anyway, dressed as a Fremen. As he travels to see Othim, he observes the nature of his quizarate in the streets of Arakin. He views the quizarate not so much as a faith but as a bureaucracy of religious civil servants. Paul is also able to witness his sister Alia preaching to a group of pilgrims, and although he has seen her do this many times, he has never been in the crowd to witness its effect on the faithful. Paul arrives at Othim's home to find the former Feda king near death with a spitting disease acquired during the jihadist wars. Othim warns Paul of a plot against him by the Fremen, and gives him as a gift a dwarf called Bijaz, who has been trained as a human distrans created by the Tlailaxu. A distrans is like a living memory recorder, 
and the dwarf contains within him the names of all the conspirators against Paul amongst the Fremen. The dwarf is part of the plot against Paul by the Trilaxu, designed to activate the hate gola against Paul at a given time. Bijaz is obviously nervous and claims to possess a nigh sense, urging Paul to leave immediately, aware as he is of the impending attack. The attack that follows is by an atomic stone burner, a weapon banned by the Great Convention and which results in the blindness of Paul and many of his men. After the attack, Paul orders that any of his men who wish it may have their sight returned by artificial Tylaxu manufactured eyes, though he himself does not take the devices. The Fremen traditionally leave their blind to die in the desert, but Paul is still able to see using his prescient vision, something which adds to the mystique and awe which his people hold for him. The Quisarate Corba is arrested and brought before judgement. In addition to having the stone burner brought to Arrakis, he's also helped to have a worm taken off planet with the aid of his Fremen co-conspirators. Corba's defence for his actions amounts to having done everything in the name of the Quisarate and obedience to Paul. His interrogation is designed to root out the other Fremen who are also conspiring against Paul. The conclusion to the events comes with the death of Chani giving birth to the twins of Moadib in her old home, Sich Tabar. Idaho's original personality is awakened by the dwarf Bijaz, and the Tlilaxu trap against Paul is finally sprung. Threatening to kill the newborn children, Skytail offers Paul to have his dead wife returned to him as a Gola, now sure that a person's memories and personality can be returned, and having Duncan Idaho as proof. Paul is able to briefly connect through his son's eyes and is able to kill the Twi'laxu before succumbing to his offer. The dwarf Bijaz however continues to present the offer and Duncan kills him at Paul's request. The story ends with Paul walking into the desert, as is traditional with the blind Fremen, to become ultimately more of a myth than a man. Apart from Irulan, the remaining members of the conspiracy despite Paul's orders to the contrary, are executed by Stilgar, and the government passes into the hands of Alia as regent. Dune Messiah ends on the philosophical musings of Duncan Idaho, who feels he might be best suited to understanding Paul and the nature of Atreides' rule. Judgment strategy, the Atreides called it in their training manuals. People are subordinate to government, but the ruled influence the rulers. Paul can be viewed in a number of aspects as the archetypal hero, and later as anti-hero, but can also be seen as the hero who is religious icon, prophet, and later divinity. Frank Herbert's view of the messianic impulse as presented through the first Dune trilogy is essentially a comment on hero worship. Carlyle in his biographically focused study of the hero and hero worship considered that within the roots of paganism, Hero worship would be the grand modifying element in that ancient system of thought. In examining the hero as divinity, he states that worship of a hero is transcendent admiration of a great man, and that hero worship endures forever while man endures. Carlyle points out here that worship of the hero as a divinity is perhaps the earliest form of hero worship in early and primitive societies, and in this case, uses Odin as his example. He suggests that Christianity may be the highest instance of hero worship where the hero is seen as a divinity and echoing Herbert's view of the messianic impulse which periodically overtakes man, suggests the masses love, venerate and bow down submissive before great men, nay can we honestly bow down to anything else? Paul is not seen as divine by the Fremen until his supposed mysterious death, after which point, blind in the desert he is seen as going through an apotheosis and raised to the point of divinity by the religion of Moadib. His return as the blind preacher and denouncement of his own religion will however relegate him back post-mortem to the position of prophet who prepares the way for Leto II. 
His subsequent murder then brings to mind the way Carlyle discusses that as times change, so too do mankind's attitudes to the hero. Paul's actual death as opposed to his imagined death changes the view of his worship by the masses, where he as the hero is no longer seen as divine, but as one God-inspired as a prophet, and hence is actually seen as a mortal. Relegated to the role of prophet, the population of the Imperium society will now come to view him as an inspired human, who as father to Leto II will have paved the way for the truly divine being, the God Emperor. In recognising his failure in the Golden Path, Paul ultimately accepts his son's new role in continuing it, describing him as the healer. In telling Gurney Halleck how he once opposed Leto II's action, he tells his former teacher to look at this Atreides youth. He is the ultimate feedback upon which our species depends. He'll reinsert into the system the results of its past performance. In describing his own passing, Paul describes his failure in carrying out the Golden Path in the following terms. Paul Atreides is no more. He tried to stand as a supreme moral symbol while he renounced all moral pretensions. He became a saint without a god, every word a blasphemy. With the passing of Paul a new religion will arise, that of the god emperor, the divinity of the son relegating his father to saint and prophet. His religion is more terrifying, far reaching and damaging to humanity than even his father's, which resulted in the death of billions. At one point Leto II tells Paul, your jihad will be a summer picnic on Caladan by comparison. Herbert is not just implicit of the dangers of heroes to society. In Children of Dune, he sets the stage for the ultimate tyrant and the all-pervasive religion that builds around him. For Herbert, after hammering home his lesson, he reiterates it again, showing the reader that, yes indeed, it could be worse. It is a new cult to be wary of. Caution is indeed indicated, but not the terror that prevents all movement. Hang loose, and when someone asks whether you're starting a new cult, do what I do. Run like hell. Children of Dune continues the exploration of the hero and society's messianic impulse, and returns to the style of the first part of the trilogy. The book concentrates more again on the systems that have grown around the following of a religious hero, although it does return to the more familiar modes of action and adventure that the story diverted from in Dune Messiah. Since Paul's disappearance into the desert, he has become a god to the people of his empire, and religion and government have fully merged in his name, and making the breaking of law a sin. His subsequent reuniting with his son and eventual death bring about another great social morphological change to the Imperium. His role in consideration of Jungian archetypes has seen him transformed through a number of these concepts, from youth to hero, syzygy to king, and ultimately hierophant to father. It now turns to Leto II to take up the mantle of the archetypal hero, and again turn it completely upon its head. His hero quest again follows much of the nature of the monomyth and Raglan's ritualistic steps, reiterating Palumbo's notion of the fractal patterns inherent within both the monomyth and the structure of the Dune series. Once again we are presented with a hero as a youth, already seen as semi-divine because of his lineage, and what initially appears to be a sympathetic protagonist. With Paul's disappearance at the end of Dune Messiah, Alia is declared regent of the Golden Lion Throne, holding it in trust for the day when Leto II comes of age. She also controls the religion of Moadib as a hierophant, a troublesome rule for her as she assumes the responsibilities of Paul but without his prescient vision. Her attempts to push this genetic ability with Melange and the combined stresses upon her begin to slowly erode her sanity which is crumbling under the weight of the multitude in her other memory. In a moment of weakness she turns to the personality of the Baron Harkonnen to help her, and always villainous, he seeks for revenge from beyond the grave. 
As such, she has become a threat to the twins Leto II and Ganyma, who are also threatened by a conspiracy against them by the Lady Wensysia, who seeks to place her own son Faradhan upon the throne. Leto II, like his father, can be viewed as part of a syzygy with his twin sister Ganyma as hero, but his hero quest seeking what Herbert liked to call the Pearl of Great Wisdom leads to a sudden apotheosis where the hero becomes divinity and at one and the same time, king and villain. Leto II is tested by his mother Jessica early in Children of Dune, reminiscent of Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohim's visit to Paul with the Gom Jabbar. The test does not have the appearance of threat to Leto II as his father's testing to see if he was human, but the youth is in peril. His mother has come to determine whether he and Ganyma are abominations, with Jessica already suspecting that her daughter Alia has succumbed to this state. Ganyma and Leto II presently surprise their grandmother, although she is still a little suspicious. We later discover Ganyma does escape the fate of abomination due to a hypnotic command that allows her to think her brother is dead. But Leto has embraced it, and accepted the help of his father within other memory to survive it. To that extent he has carefully lied and manipulated his mother, who is now representing the sisterhood's interests once more. Well and good cousin, she asked me if I were abomination. I answered in the negative. That was my first treachery. You see, Ganyma escaped this, but I did not. I was forced to balance the inner lives under the pressure of excessive melange. I had to seek the active cooperation of those aroused lives within me. Doing this, I avoided the most malignant and chose a dominant helper thrust upon me by the inner awareness which was my father. I am not, in truth, my father or this helper. Then again, I am not the second Leto. It is only when it is too late that Jessica realises that both Ganyma and Leto II possess the memories of a multitude of Bene Gesserit's sisters, and hence able to discern their motives and outwit them at every point. Towards the end of Children of Dune, we see the differences in Leto II as he is slowly changing into the god Emperor, already losing his humanity. In seeking out a forbidden siege, Jack Kurutu, I believe Leto II varies from the path of the hero quest to become something else. He does not seek out the magical beast that guards the treasure, but rather through the use of large amounts of melange, he transcends the typical hero quest, and rather than slaying or conquering the beast, dragon or worm, he becomes it. In one other interesting sense, he not only slays the beast that guards the treasure, the pearl of great prize, he has also become the prize too. The sand trout squirmed on his hand, elongating, stretching. As it moved, he felt a counterpart elongating and stretching of the vision he had chosen, this thread, not that one. He felt the sand trout becoming thin, covering more and more of his hand. No sand trout had ever before encountered a hand such as this one, every cell supersaturated with spice. No other human had ever lived and reasoned in such a condition. The knowledge from those uncounted lifetimes which blended themselves with him provided the certainty through which he chose the precise adjustments, starving off the death from an overdose which would engulf him if he relaxed his watchfulness for only a heartbeat. And at the same time he blended himself with the sand trout, feeding on it, feeding it, learning it. In accepting the golden path fully, that which his father Paul could not do, he also accepts full prescience and the fact that he must lose his humanity. Leto II consumes vast amounts of melange and then allows the sand trout to cover his skin. His apotheosis is an act of drug-induced transcendental symbiosis with the worms of Arrakis, and symbolically, he too will become Shai Halud and Shaitan, both divinity and adversary, to the Fremen and the Imperium. 
His divinity then is one where he accepts that he must abandon his humanity and become one with the ecological order of Arrakis. As such, his transformation will change Arrakis as well, reminding us of the mythological association with nature and its workings. Leto II's divinity becomes clear, his association in religion made apparent from the future texts that introduce each chapter. There is a psychological and religious continuity of Herbert's ideas from The Dragon in the Sea and Dune, where at one point Leto II is described within a revised OC Bible in a similar vein to the beast from the Book of Revelations. Thou didst divide the sand by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the desert. Yea, I behold thee as a beast coming up from the dunes. Thou hast the two horns of the lamb, but thou speakest as the dragon. Revised Orange Catholic Bible, Aaron 2, 4. Leto II's transformation is to give purpose to evolution and, therefore, to give purpose to our lives. In removing himself from the human evolutionary path, he has allowed himself to become the beast, the ultimate predator that will crush and threaten mankind in order to facilitate its ability to survive Kralizek. His purpose is to open up the closed systems that humanity, in its evolutionary stagnation, has created through their empires of order. The implication in his transformation is apparent to him, and what takes him further away from humanity allows him to prevent evolutionary sequences from reoccurring. These sequences are seen as the closed systems which mankind has fallen into, and as Leto realises, there can be no truly closed systems in life. Children of Dune ends with Leto II ascending to the Golden Lion Throne, bearing his new skin which is slowly transforming him. Alia is dead, having succumbed to the multitude and committing suicide. The plans to usurp the throne have all failed, and Leto marries his sister Ganema to secure the throne and begin his breeding program. The next time we see Leto II in God Emperor of Dune, we are witnessing the end of his three and a half thousand year tyranny. His resemblance to the young man we knew is completely gone, and he appears as a giant worm, some stunted limbs and his face being all that remains of his human physiology. In transforming himself into the God Emperor, Leto II, like his Aunt Alia, has let himself be taken over to a certain extent by the ancestors of his other memory. But unlike Alia, who loses her ability to control the multitude of voices, he is able to manage and suppress the majority of these personalities by allowing one in particular to come forward. Herbert calls this personality Harum, which represents the transliteration of the Horus name of the Egyptian pharaoh Khufu, also known as Cheops. I'm a community dominated by one who was ancient and surpassingly powerful. He fathered a dynasty which endured for 3000 of our years. His name was Harum, and, until his line trailed out in the congenital weaknesses and superstitions of a descendant, his subjects lived in a rhythmic sublimity. They moved unconsciously with the changes of the seasons. They bred individuals who tended to be short lived, superstitious, and easily led by a god king. Taken as a whole, they were a powerful people. Their survival as a species became habit. In bringing to the fore a personality that has ruled with a tyrannical hand, Leto II is able to draw on those experiences to ensure his peace moves according to plan. His rule is complete and his prescience ensures this ability, creating an awe and devotion in his followers, and making it very difficult for his enemies to act against him, let alone survive. Although Paul represents Herbert's fullest attempt at exploring the disastrous hero and what happens to a society when such an individual is slavishly worshipped, Leto II is the apex of this attitude. Paradoxically, as a protagonist, we are privy to Leto II's actions and thoughts. Most of God Emperor of Dune 
acts as an insight into an inhuman god who rules mankind with a velvet glove inside a mailed fist. Through the glimpses of Leto II's last vestiges of humanity, we see a very human ruler who acts for the benefit of humanity, despite the appearances of his actions appearing to be incredibly cruel and tyrannical. Frank Herbert's presentation of his belief that heroes are disastrous for society, and that superheroes can compound those mistakes to an even greater scale, could be seen ultimately as a failure, depending upon his intent. Herbert, after all, does not like providing solutions for society's problems, but rather likes to present dichotomies to his readers rather than any real answers. Perhaps the paradox he is trying to avoid here is that in presenting the dangers of the hero to society, he himself feared that his readership might place him on a pedestal for doing so. He does succeed in highlighting the dangers of a society slavishly following leaders, and the systems of power they implement around them, religions and governments in particular. As to his heroes and superheroes being dangerous to society, it should be noted that the tyranny of Leto II and the jihad of Paul Muadi Betrides have both one singular goal, the saving of mankind from annihilation. Their means with which they do so is the hydraulic despotism of their control over Melange and the religious systems built up around their divinity. The reader of the Dune series is aware of this, even though the populations of the Imperium are not. Paul and Leto II in all that they do, regardless of how terrible it may seem, is for the sake of humanity. Paul's failure in the Golden Path is that ultimately he cannot give up his humanity, even though he is willing to give up his life. It is this failure that takes our original hero of the series down the road of an ultimately ineffectual anti-hero. Leto II is able to do both, suffering his four deaths and separating his consciousness to become the worm once again. His sacrifice is heroic, but its result has the appearance of villainy. His transformation as he dies lets loose all the symbiotic sand trout from his body, which will return the worms and melange to Arrakis in abundance, bringing about another ecological change. Each worm will contain a pearl of his awareness, his resurrection as the divided god, and the assurance of his continued worship as divinity, tyrant, and devil. His tyranny has resulted in genetic changes to humans through his breeding program, as well as evolving certain technologies to ensure that mankind is capable of surviving Kralizek. Although sceptical of the author's error-filled representation of Dune's extreme environment, Roberts takes note of Frank Herbert's accomplishment of constructing an effective political satire, perhaps not realising that they are both intrinsically linked. Herbert's achievement, in other words, was to render the coming of the Messiah in an accurately observed political context, noting as he did so how close the messianic impulse is to the fascistic, God Emperor of Dune with its powerful central image of the dictator as a monstrous worm, may be one of the most effective satires on fascism yet written. Having died before completing the final part of the Dune series, readers have had to wait many years to learn of the nature of Kralizek and whether humanity survives the apocalyptic event because of the creation of the Golden Path. In Hunters of Dune and Sandworms of Dune, we see that ultimately mankind does survive, because of the Golden Path and the breeding programs of the Bene Gesserit and the Atreides. Humanity returns to its need to use technology against the thinking machines, but as the eventual symbiosis of man and machine, Duncan Idaho merging with an AI consciousness that creates a new evolutionary paradigm. Duncan is primarily reincarnated by the God Emperor for two reasons in particular. His undying devotion and loyalty to the Atreides family, and his rebellious streak. It is the ability to break away from his blind loyalty to House Atreides, which seems almost written into his genetic code, 
that represents his true triumph as a man becoming independent of his messianic impulse. It is because of this that he becomes the true hero of the Dune series, and the reader must ultimately question this misdirection on the part of the author. Duncan's sacrifice as the hero once again saves humanity, and again this action goes beyond the mere death of an individual. Like Leto II, Idaho is forced to give up his humanity. The example of the extraordinary individual, the hero, in the end saves humanity from extinction and echoes Samuel Butler's philosopher once again. As man and machine must learn to live in symbiosis, we return to the question of considering what if machines were to be regarded as a part of man's own physical nature, being really nothing but extracorporeal limbs. Mankind, it seems, is indeed a machinate animal, and the systems we create can both save us and destroy us. It is breaking out of perceived closed systems, renewing ourselves as a species, that is necessary to ensure we do not lapse into an evolutionary rut. But if it would seem that, as Herbert suggests, we shouldn't follow heroes blindly, then surely the conclusion reached is that even he doesn't truly believe that all heroes are bad for society. Herbert's heroes take extraordinary measures for the survival of humanity, not out of any possible personal gain, but for the need to create a greater good that is unforeseen. In the case of Leto II and Duncan Idaho, they sacrifice everything for the survival of the species and show an understanding of the complexities that motivate the people in the streets. Both of these characters are to an extent followed blindly by the masses, Idaho is followed by the fish speakers because Leto II tells them to, and Leto II is followed because he is the ultimate predator and tyrant, but both are in effect rebels. Their true purpose is to ensure that the masses never again have the need to serve a messiah. The true slavish obedience that Herbert is warning his readers about is focused on Paul Atreides by the Fremen, and it is his heroic actions and subsequent selfish failure to establish the golden path that leads to the destruction of the people of Arrakis. As Carlyle points out, no sadder proof can be given by a man of his own littleness than disbelief in great men, and truly the history of the world was the biography of great men. <laughs>